Good, good. <clears throat> so, uh, let's start with the physics. John, are you ready for action? Yeah, I'm ready. So, okay. So, then I, I will suggest that everyone, uh, most of the participants now, they um, switch off the, the cameras, uh, the videos, and then we'll start with the with John, who is going to introduce our first speaker. Ah, I'll, I'll let you be, John. Sorry. All the hey. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning, Nico. Uh, first off, I just want to congratulate you and all the team that have set this up. This, I mean, this is a technological miracle to be able to, to do this truly across the globe, as we're going to find out even in this, this first session. So fingers crossed, everything works. Nobody's home Wi-Fi goes down or nobody. <laughs> nobody <laughs> absolutely brilliant. Anyway, it's a brilliant program. And it's, it's just such a, as you know, such a shame that we can't be there in person because uh, I mean, that, that, that's, that's obviously the best thing. And for the meeting in, I think it was March this year, I got as far, uh, I was in a taxi on the way before we were pulled from, from coming to South Africa. So, uh, so it's a real, you know, it's a real pleasure to be, uh, to be here, but only, in, uh, only virtually. So I just wish everybody uh, all the best and hope the conference goes uh, as well. And, and your organization so far has been absolutely fantastic. So let's start with the, with the science. Uh, we have four talks in this session. Uh, and as I said before, this is a, a global conference. Uh, it's quite early in the morning here in the UK, for me anyway, and I was gonna complain about that, but then I saw Steve Yates, so I thought that's a pretty good effort to, uh, to get up at whatever time he, he, he's got up. Uh, but now we're gonna go over to uh, Australia. Uh, Tibor Kvedi is gonna talk uh, from uh, from Canberra in Australian National University. So this is just amazing, uh, <laughs> an amazing experience. So uh, I hand over to Tibor who's gonna tell us about the, the radiative width of the Hoyle state from pair conversion and proton gamma gamma coincidence measurements. Over to you, Tibor. Thanks very much. Let me start sharing my screen uh, with the presentation. Uh, here we go. And uh, the uh, full, full, this uh, yeah. Okay, all right. It's meant to be slideshow here. Okay, so I think, it, uh, I think if you go in window, Tibor, it'll show you. Window, yeah. Uh, uh, oh, okay, window. thanks very much. Uh, uh, I get confused with this one. It's either view. View, let me see. Full screen. View. Here we go. Oh, oh. I have to remember that. Okay, sorry. Anyway, so I, I talk about the radiative width of the holy state uh, from two experiments and which has been carried out, carried out over the years, uh, one in Europe, one in Australia, and we had some very nice uh, results uh, for the community. I'd like to devote this, uh, dedicate this talk to my uh, late friend and mentor, Ray Speer, uh, he is the one who suggested me the Holy State back in around 2006. And we spoke about the Holy State many, many times. He was always very interested in that. This is the outline of my talk. I will give a little introduction on the triple for eight and uh, the problem, what we try to solve. And then I will talk about the two experiments, one at the ANU, the other one at University of Oslo. And finally, I will say a little bit about the uh, astrophysical implication, which I believe I'm not an astrophysicist, so I'm waiting for the astrophysicist to interpret or maybe discard our finding that is, is uh, not, not uh, possible. But I think it will be the future. So uh, the ex explaining the origin of elements is one of the most exciting scientific project on the borderline or uh, on the interface of nuclear physics and astrophysics. And Fred Hoy suggested that all the heavier element, heavier than, than carbon, has been formed inside the stars 
in uh, uh, nuclear reactions. In these uh, stars, which are very, very large uh, compared to the sun, uh, the conditions are extreme, very high temperatures and uh, very high pressure, high density of material, and uh, the, the distribution of the material, the composition of, of the material is very different. So this is uh, our knowledge about the elemental abundance in a solar system. As we can see, hydrogen, helium are the most abundant elements, and the elements uh, which uh, multiple of helium-4 uh, alpha particles, they are one of the most abundant elements. And the early suggestion was that it is a very simple and, and plausible picture that when we're putting together two, three, four, five, up to 10 alpha particles, we can actually form carbon-12, oxygen-16, and so on, up to calcium-40. However, there's a problem, and that is beryllium-8. And it was recognized around the middle of the 20th century that this is a problem, and people try to figure out what uh, is happening. Beryllium-8 is very, very short-lived, about 10 to minus 17 seconds, 16 seconds. Uh, and uh, when we're looking at uh, the abundance chart, we can see that the abundance about around beryllium, lithium, boron, are very, very high, 10 order of magnitude is smaller than, than lower than, than hydrogen and, and helium. So obviously these elements are very rare. And in order to work, somehow have to pass this uh, island of no-go area around beryllium-8. Fred Hoyle had the suggestion that there might be, uh, must be a state, an excited state, just above the threshold in carbon-12 which is the entry state for the process, which is now called the triple alpha reaction. In the center of the stars, there is lots of helium particles. This is part of the helium uh, burning cycle. Two alpha particles fuse together from beryllium-8. And if within that very, very short time frame, a third alpha particle is uh, come by and form carbon-12, it will be the entry state will be this excited state. And he postulated that this excited state has a special property, which is alpha unbound. So most of the time it will decay back where it came from and will disintegrate, but some of the uh, fraction of the time it will decay down to carbon, to the ground state of carbon 12, uh, which is the, uh, for, uh, that's the way how carbon 12 and all the heavier elements that uh, are formed once carbon has been synthesized. The rate, which is the production rate, is uh, developed, a formula developed by Rolf and Rodney in 1988, which is proportional with the radiative width. Radiative width is the transition, absolute transition property of the E2 and E0 transitions uh, de uh, decaying from the Hoyle state. Uh, this is the energy released when the three alpha particle disintegrates and decaying through alpha decay and the temperature uh, in, in uh, uh, stars. Uh, gamma red is one of the most important nuclear physics uh, quantity which uh, we can provide or require for nuclear astrophysics. Experimentally, this quantity can't be measured directly. How it is measured in the last 70 years that three different quantities are measured. The only absolute quantity is, is gamma pi E naught, which is the E zero transition rate. That's the only one which can be measured and all the, the two terms measured uh, you know, different reactions. I highly recommend uh, Martin Freer and uh, Hans Van Bo, uh, 2014 review paper on uh, the Hoyle state, which really describe all the physical aspects. And there is lots of nuclear physics interest in the Hoyle state itself. It's a problem when we try to describe with modern nuclear theories, it still uh, has to be developed. But over the last 10 years, it has been uh, improved quite significantly. The first quantity is the radiative width to the total width ratio, which has to be measured. Over the history, it was measured eight times. It is known about 2.7%. That, that is the data in 2014. Uh, as you can see, uh, the spanning, the experiment spanning from 1961 to 1976. 
Most of the experiment is based actually counting on carbon twerk formed in nuclear reaction and uh, counting the number of uh, carbon twerk nuclei which actually survived, they didn't go through the alpha decay, but through the electromagnetic decay, uh, decay to ground state and uh, uh, remains in a system or can be uh, detected as uh, carbon twerk nuclei. There is only one experiment in 1976, uh, when they measure the electromagnetic transition rates, uh, the E2 gamma rays uh, coming from the, from the Hoyle state. There's also a third decay channel, which caused some excitement in recent times, which is a direct decay. The Hoyle state actually can decay back to the, uh, uh, can disintegrate directly into three alpha particles. And uh, the initial limit on the Hello. decay width was quite high and it has been reduced. Sorry? Can I continue? Go ahead, uh, Tibo, please continue. And colleagues, uh, when you come in, won't you mute your mics, please? Thank you, Tibo. Okay, all right. Sorry, I thought it's a feedback from my, my uh, speaker, so I uh, lowered a little bit. Uh, so the third uh, decay process will produce uh, three alpha particles and uh, best estimate is very, uh, today it's very, very small, it's almost negligible, but it has no implication what we try to do here. The second quantity, which is the partial E0 width, which is the E0 transition, uh, strengths uh, respect to the total transition strengths. That has been measured um, four times. Uh, the uncertainty on this quantity is relatively high. That was the largest one around 9% and driving the, the overall uncertainty of the triple for eight. Uh, and, and that was a problem. Uh, there was only one measurement using a magnetic spectrometer back in 1977 in Brookhaven National Lab. And there was another measurement which is based on scintillator detectors. Uh, the only recent experiment to do anything with these two terms was in uh, early 2000s in Michigan State uh, University, uh, Klaus Tur and, and uh, some Austin. They developed a similar uh, instrument what Robertson tried to do, but no final data has been published from this work. So there is no new data uh, on this one since 1977. The third term, which is the E0 uh, transition rate, has been measured again eight times. The last two measurement, one is 2005, the other one is 2010, possible the most accurate one. This E0 strength has been measured in high energy electron scattering. It's a difficult experiment, but the two measurement very discrepant. It's differ about five sigma. We adopted uh, for our work, adopted what was recommended by uh, uh, Martin Free and Hans Frimbo. Uh, the latest experiment, uh, 2010 data, uh, was adopted for, for this work. So if we put all these quantities together, what we know is that the radiative width of the Hoyle state is about uh, 3.8 milli electron volt and has a 12% uncertainty. So that's where we are, uh, at, uh, that's where we were in, in uh, 2014. The idea to, to measure, the initial idea what we had at the ANU was actually doing something brand new, something nobody tried before, at least in the literature, there is no uh, sign that anybody tried to do it. Namely, we wanted to set up an experiment when we do the two transitions coming from the Hoyle state in the same experiment. One is an E2 transition, the other one is an E0 transition. The only possible way to do it, it would be electron-positron pair measurement. And this is the formula what we developed or, or put forward. This would be the way how we can actually define the, uh, uh, determine the radiative width from this experiment. Now we have to say that based on the knowledge what we had, so the electromagnetic transition, the total intensity is 0.04% of the Hoyle state decay. 98.5% is the E2 gamma ray. 
zero uh, one and a half percent is the e0 transition and 0.09 percent is the e2 pair conversion so the doing this measurement is very uh, challenging very uh, 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 difficult we know that nevertheless we we decided to do the experiments so this is the uh, two experiments what i will talk about one was in oslo in 2014 when we uh, done a new measurement on a radi uh, partial radiative width, gamma radio over gamma. That was a proton gamma gamma triple coincidence measurement. And the other was electron positron pair conversion measurement when we remeasured the uh, relative E0 partial width. This is the quantity which is less precisely defined. This is about 9, 8%, 9% of the, uh, the relative uncertainty. Two papers has been published a few weeks or a few months ago, uh, one in a physical review letters, the other one is FISREF C, and, and I reporting on, on these uh, results what we're getting. So a little bit about uh, basic uh, quantities, uh, electron positron uh, pair conversion. So atomic nuclei undergoing electromagnetic, uh, uh, emitting electromagnetic radiations, the first order in first order, they will emit gamma rays. The second order process is an atomic uh, internal conversion when uh, the transition energy and impulse momentum will be carried away by, the, by a conversion electron. The third process, which is happening very close to the, the uh, nuclear surface, the virtual gamma photon will be converted to an electron positron pair. As a consequence, the threshold, energy threshold for such a process is twice the electron rest mass. So no nuclear transition can happen uh, below one M, roughly one MeV energy. When we want to work out the transition property, it will be sum up all the contribution, the gamma ray, the conversion electrons, and the pair conversion. The usual uh, quantity what people are using is the conversion quotients which is the ratio of the conversion electron or pair conversion intensities over the gamma ray intensities. Um, interesting uh, feature of the pair conversion is that it is increasing with energy rather than decreasing in energy. This is a calculated uh, conversion quotient curve for Z equals six and E2 transitions. These are the K conversion, the L conversion. And as you can see, the pair conversion shoots up from one MeV and just goes uh, for uh, very increasing with energy. Uh, also interesting in, in uh, difference in uh, compared to normal conversion, that uh, internal conversion increasing by multiple order. So when uh, M1, E2, e, E3, M3, and so on, uh, the pair conversion goes the other way. So E1 transition is, is most likely. And E0 transition, which are uh, interesting uh, uh, features or beasts, if you like, uh, the pure E0 transition only happening between uh, zero plus or zero minus states and no single gamma uh, transition allowed. They only can proceed with internal conversion or electron positron pair conversion. One of the transition from the Hoyle state, the 7.6 MeV transition is one of the E0 transition. In fact, one of the strongest E0 uh, strengths what we can record in, in uh, nuclear systems. So the measurements has been carried out with the annual super A spectrometer. This is a picture of the spectrometer, how it looks like uh, today. Um, People, uh, I mean, the beam coming from the left, we have a superconductive solenoid, it is the helium dual, this is the de detector array, and most of the system, what is relevant for the experiment is actually hidden, we can't see it. We have two gamma ray detector, one is close proximity, is Compton suppressed, and we have a new detector, which is behind these uh, units, we can't really see them, and this is about 1.4 meters away, and were shielded, and that's what we use for the current measurements. This is a different view of the system. So the beam comes in from the, from the right. The solenoid is mounted perpendicular to the, to the beam axis. That's the magnetic field direction. This is the target. Here is the detector. 
for electron positron pairs, we have to detect both particles, which are ejected with a separation angle and they sharing the available kinetic energy. Uh, these two figures shows the, the theoretical distribution for a 3.2 MeV E2 transition. That's the E2 transition from the Hoyle state. And this is the distribution between en energy and separation angle, positive energy and separation angle for a Z0 transition from the Hoyle state. So the two particles ejected in a magnetic field and because the magnetic field, they going in opposite uh, helicity. And if we, uh, we put the detector where the electrons and positrons completing nearly two and a half loops, so they most likely will be hitting uh, adjacent segments. The detector is, uh, has six silicon detectors, nine millimeter thick, because the highest energy what we want to record is around three and a half MeV, just for uh, uh, explaining it. So 7.6 MeV is the transition energy of the E0 transition. Both particle has to go through this complicated path, not hitting any of the absorbers. So the energy of the two particles will be the same and we need one MeV to create them. So the 6.6 .6 MeV is the total kinetic energy and we uh, picking up electrons and positrons when the energy is shared equally. So it will be around 3.3 .3 MeV. So that's why we designed the system to be optimum up to about three and a half MeV. That little figure here shows numerical simulation. This is the distribution of the uh, 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 positrons, how they will reach the, the detector, uh, which are reaching the detector. This is the energy and this is the separation angle. So uh, you can see that is not, uh, we're not uh, detecting all the particles, only very small, small fraction of the particles, but these detectors are mounted in a very shielded area and hopefully it will have to reduce the background. Uh, this little figure up here is uh, comparing uh, how the spectrometer works for conversion electrons and also comparing with simulations, as you can see, the two agree very well. And this just want to demonstrate that we understand very well how the spectrometer works. Uh, some, some results with the spectrometer from the, uh, uh, what we're getting. So this is a energy energy matrix. When uh, two detectors are fired, we record the energy and we record the time difference between them. We can use the time difference to filter out random events. And this is the distribution of the 3.3 MeV E0 transition in calcium 40. It's only take, takes a few minutes to collect a nice spectrum. And uh, this is the, this yellow uh, distribution here is the electron positron pairs. And if we uh, add up the energies in, in other ways, other words, we operate the system in some coincidence mode, we can get a nice line spectra. The total energy is uh, two point, around 2.3 uh, 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 MeV, which is the kinetic energy sum of these pairs. The only known uh, uh, pair spectrum in the literature back in 1977 with a four scintillator pair spectrometer, you can see that our spectrometer has a much better energy resolution. And that's really when what is important for a uh, very sensitive and, and low yield measurement, you need a excellent uh, background subtraction. subtraction. So the building of the spare spectrometer started in, in 2009. That was the first success when we ever seen any electron positron pairs. And that time we used our old uh, absorber system and one of the array what we had at that time. And we were very happy that we had electron positron pairs. Uh, in 2011, uh, we got the major equipment grant uh, to build many components. And the first experiment started in 2014. This is one of the first spectrum ever recorded showing the 7.6 MeV E0 transition from the, from the Hoyle state. Over the years, we've done lots of improvements, lots of simulations and, and uh, understanding how the spectrometer works. I think I, I will skip it. If anybody interested, I'm more than happy to talk about that. Uh, we also done other nuclear structure measurements, and that was mainly to 
benchmarking the spectrometer and also we realized that having a nice electron positron pair spectrometer, we can do a bunch of interesting measurements. So our aim was to exploring E0 transitions between N and Z equal 20, which is calcium 40 and uh, nickel 56. And these red uh, squares indicating the nuclei when we done some measurements, which include, for example, the uh, uh, E0 transition in calcium 40 from the super deformed uh, state at 5.2 MeV to the ground state. It hasn't been published, it will coming, but there are a few publications which al uh, already came out from this study and it was very important to, to gain understanding about the, the spectrometer and also the physics is, itself is very, very interesting. So this is the, the spectra what we recorded for uh, carbon 12. Uh, the way how we operated it, that we set the magnetic field optimum to, for the 4.4 MeV transition, another setting for oxygen 16 line, which is a free uh, contaminant, but very good to uh, monitor what's happening inside the spectrometer. And the third current was set to the 7.6 MeV E0 transition. And uh, we measured each point for a few minutes or 15 minutes and we use gamma ray detectors to, to monitor the relative yield between the different magnetic field settings. Uh, I have to say that overall, we were able to run about one micron proton, proton beam on the targets at 10 and a half MeV proton scattering on carbon 12. Uh, and the count rate was still very, very low just because the detectors were extremely sheltered and also the nuclear reaction is very, very clean. This is the formula, what we use to deduce the uh, E0 partial width. To do that, we have to measure the, the uh, relative uh, uh, ratio of the E0 and E2 transitions. Of course, we have to normalize with the gamma ray intensity, use the gamma ray intensity. We had to measure the, the protons exciting the, the uh, two plus state and the Holy state at 7.6 MeV. So we need the single proton uh, intensities. We need the uh, uh, pair conversion efficiencies. And we also have to know the conversion questions of the E2 transition, which hasn't been measured. We used BRICC to deduce the value. The uh, pair conversion uh, efficiency has been deduced from numerical simulations. There is no suitable uh, gamma ray source what uh, can be used for this measurement. Um, the efficiency on also affected by uh, the, the fact that uh, the two plus state in uh, carbon 12 is can be aligned. So the 4.4 MeV transition can have an angular distribution. That angular distribution will be reflected on the pair conversion distribution. So we had to measure the the gamma ray angular distribution, and we had to develop a numerical tool to actually calculate this effect. And we find that it is about 7.5% change reduction in the electron positron pair efficiency for the E0 transition because it's coming from a zero plus state. There is no alignment effect, so there is not, a, not an issue. Uh, it was a different measurement, another measurement what we had to do to measure the single proton ratios. And what we done, uh, uh, what, what we had to do, uh, the pair conversion measurement has been done with one to two milligram per qa centimeter targets. The energy loss in a one milligram target is about 55 kilo electron volt. And to, to def define these uh, uh, um, proton uh, ratios, cross-section ratios, or yield ratios, we had to use thin targets uh, to evaluate this problem. We got some help from our nuclear reaction uh, people, uh, Caitlin Good, uh, Cook, Nanda Daskupta, and David Hind. They have a beautiful uh, spectrometer Bellin called Bellin. It has several silicon arrays, double-sided silicon strip detectors, which cover a large uh, uh, fraction of the solid angle, and we can do uh, within a minute, we can do a complete angle distribution measurement between 20 to 160 degrees, and uh, we can get simultaneously all the information what we need. So we done these measurements, and we done between 10.4 to 10.7 MeV, 
And this is a graph showing the relative ratio of the two plus and the zero plus excitation. This is a fraction uh, deduced from this measurement and uh, taking into account the uh, energy loss of the protons inside the one milligram target, we can deduce a, a ratio for the, uh, what we required for this formula. A different ratio has been deduced for the two milligram target. It was only one of the three uh, experiments when we had to do, use this formula. So putting all together, these are the ratios of the E0 to E2 pair intensities. This is the uh, relative gamma pi over gamma ratio uh, for the, from the three experiment. And the adopted value is about 8.2 uh, plus minus five and uh, 10 to minus six. So the branching ratio is extremely small. If you can, it's uh, uh, eight of a million. So it's very, very weak uh, decay branch. Uh, just for comparison, this is the only pair conversion measurement has been done in 1977 by Arburger in Brookhaven National Lab. The red points are two runs, which is published in the paper, and the blue curve is our pair conversion measurement here at the ANU. You can see the data is much more detailed, the background is much lower, and also the the resolution is much, much better. So we're confident that our data is better than what Arbuger actually produced. Overall, uh, what we get from this measurement that the relative ratio gamma pi uh, E naught over gamma is increased by about 14%, but most importantly, the uncertainty half. So it's about 5% now rather than 9%. So that was the first real success uh, from this program. I also want to comment on the E2 transition. That was our original plan to measure the E2 transition and turn out it was extremely difficult. Uh, the E2 transition, at least hint, has been seen in all three major exp experiments, what we done. The intensity of the 3.2 MeV E2 transition is about 10,000 times weaker than the E2, the 4.4 MeV transition. So what we find that uh, this uh, 3.2 MeV transition is somehow covered or buried under the tail of this 4.4 MeV transition. This is one of the experiments uh, when we fix the magnetic field to be optimum to the 3.2 MeV transition. You might see a little bit of uh, feature on the top. And uh, when we subtract the background, do some fitting, we can see maybe one peak. Definitely, this is the carbon 13, 3.09 MeV, E1 transition, and maybe something what we can see around the 3.2 MeV. So further improvement has to be made in a spectrometer in order to see it, uh, possible in, order, uh, in a uh, range about factor 10 or 20 improvement in a background, and then we should be able to see this, this peak, but it hasn't happened yet. So the other measurement, which was in Oslo, uh, is, is a, a proton gamma gamma measurement. Uh, this is the adopted value, uh, 4.13 uh, plus minus 11, 10 to minus four from eight experiment. Four of the experiment uh, carried out in between 1974 and 76, they were particle experiment when they counted the surviving uh, carbon-12 uh, ions after a nuclear reaction. And also they, they uh, seen the alpha particles and a scattered beam. And for example, all the experiments suffered the same problem. One of them is 1975 Davis, when they commenting in a text that the uh, recoil detector was actually running at 30 kilohertz. Uh, so it's very difficult to do a measurement and, and pull out a very small fraction of the, of the data. Nevertheless, all these measurement looks like consistent. The only gamma ray measurement has been done uh, OPST in, in um, Texas, University of Texas, and uh, that was uh, uh, using a similar method to ours. So what we used in Oslo is the Cactus and Siri equipment. Cactus for the gamma ray detect detection, 26 uh, sodium iodine detected five by five, uh, 22 centimeter distance 
OPS used four detectors at 10 centimeters, so it's much, much closer. Uh, we had 64 delta E detectors at five centimeters. Uh, OPS used four particle detectors at two centimeters, so much, much closer. Our count rate was limited, total count rate on a system to about 10 kilohertz, and OPS uh, uh, count rate was 25 kilohertz on each gamma ray detector and 10 kilohertz on each particle detector. So they were running very, very high rates. Overall, they observed many, produced many more than us, uh, ho uh, holy states produced in a 12-day experiment, and they had about three times more data, but uh, uh, I think uh, I, uh, the data is, is uh, affected by very high count rate and, and random events. So our analysis is, is focused on that. So this is the way how we deduced uh, the gamma-gamma over gamma ratio, which is the uh, ratio of the E2 transition decaying from the Hoyle state. That is coming from proton gamma gamma measurement. So the scattered proton exciting the Hoyle state and two gamma rays, one is the E2 transition 3.2 MeV and the E2 transition from the 4.4 MeV transition. But this transition is 10,000 times stronger in a singles because most of the time we will excite uh, the 4.4 uh, MeV state. So that uh, makes it uh, difficult. We have to know the, the single proton intensities. We have to know the triple coincidence intensities of proton gamma gamma coincidences. We have to know the detection efficiencies. And we also have to work out the angular correlation uh, between uh, the particle detectors when they're going through a zero to zero cascade. Uh, this is some of the, the spectra. This is single protons. Uh, the spectrum itself is extremely clean. Uh, as you can see, the 7.6 MeV proton peak is about uh, one fifth of the 4.4 MeV peak. However, one out of 2,500 proton will actually produce a cascade, what we try to pull out. In a single gamma ray spectrum is dominated by the 4.4 MeV transition and the 3.2 MeV transition is partially overlapping with the second escape peak from the, from the uh, 4.4 MeV transition. In the experiment, we recorded proton gamma times. So every time when we, when we had a, a proton, we uh, measured if, if there is, it was a gamma ray, we measured the gamma ray. If two gamma rays uh, uh, was observed, then we have two proton gamma time differences. And uh, from this, we can actually build up proton gamma gamma coincidences. This is the the proton gamma time difference spectrum of the events, that's the prompt and the, the secondary peaks are appearing at around 70 nanosecond apart. These are the cyclotron frequencies, uh, secondary peaks. So we uh, can have a, a case when uh, the proton or the gamma, uh, the gamma ray will be observed in, from a different uh, uh, secondary peak and causing a, a random event but that will be very, very useful to establish the random rate. So this is the uh, proton spectrum. This is gated by the uh, two gamma rays, 3.2 MeV, 4.4 MeV gamma ray coming from the Hoyle state. And we requested that both gamma ray has to have a, a proton gamma time difference corresponding from the prompt time peak. Within that, spectrum, when we project, uh, project out the protons, we have 50 times more 4.4 MeV protons, which is random than the 7.6 MeV. Uh, so we use the secondary peaks and the count rates from the secondary peak through an, a simple equation, subtracting and adding back some uh, uh, background background events and uh, demanding uh, that no uh, real 4.4 MeV, 4.4 MeV coincidence should be seen. So we can actually establish a, a normalization factor, which is the, the scaling factor for the electronic circuit and, and everything else. Using the scaling factor, we can actually establish, uh, work out the real triple gamma gamma uh, coincidence rates. And as you can see from the figure, the 7.6 MeV proton peak reduced a little bit, but uh, survived uh, of the procedure. 
but all the proton, uh, the random protons of the 4.4 MeV actually has been removed. So that was just an illustration how we dealt with the randoms. This is a spectrum of the gamma rays when we uh, gated by the 7.6 MeV protons and the way how we uh, uh, put this matrix on bottom, uh, here we have the gamma ray energy, here we ha have the summed energy of the two gamma rays. The two gamma ray summed energy will be about 7.6 MeV and every event, which is two gamma rays, will contribute two events to this matrix. So we have a 3.2 and we have a 4.4 MeV transition and uh, the red line indicates the gate what has been used for, for extract uh, the next uh, spectrum from, from this data. At the bottom, you can see the 3D picture of this matrix and the two gamma rays, the 3.2 and 4.4 MeV transition and XMEV are separated. On the left-hand side is Obst, uh, one of Obst's uh, paper, uh, spectrum from his paper. I have to say that none of the figures has been any scale in his paper. So we really don't know what, uh, how many counts he had. Nevertheless, this is the summed energy gate and there is absolutely no peak. Nevertheless, they put a gate on the summed energy and pulled out some numbers. So it's a very difficult measurement and, and have to be very careful with, with the randoms. So uh, here is the final spectrum. Um, what we get, the gamma gamma spectrum showing the two gamma rays and the, and the yields of, uh, corresponding to the triple alpha coincidences. Uh, to do that and, and analyze, uh, extract the relative uh, radiative bit, we had to work out the absolute photopeak efficiency, gamma gamma correlation uh, coefficients, which is happening, uh, happened with Penelope, and also we uh, uh, confirmed our efficiencies uh, using silicon 28 reactions. Some of the sorting has been reproduced in Oslo, which was very important to make sure that is uh, our analysis is solid and uh, using the uh, values we have three different numbers for a proton gamma gamma triple coincidences this is the number of events what we actually find uh, from this experiment and the uh, radiative width the partial radiative width can be extracted from this ratio what we extracted from the e to, uh, proton gamma uh, gamma coincidences using the theoretical conversion questions and the E0 partial width. This is the gamma rad over gamma. This is the second quantity what we had to uh, extract to make some improvement. That value itself is about 50% higher than what was known before. So this is obviously a, an important, a very significant change and it requires independent uh, confirmation with, with new measurements. In summary, so uh, we've done uh, uh, two measurements. From the electron positron pair measurement, the E0 partial width has increased by 14%. The proton gamma gamma measurement, the radiative, relative uh, e, uh, electromagnetic radiation width uh, increased by 50%. However, when we combine the two together, this enters in inverse way, in inverse format what we get is a 34% increase of the radiative width. So that's the, the final results, what we are getting uh, from this study. Um, very quickly, because I think uh, time is running out for me, the implication for astrophysics. This is an exciting question. And uh, uh, it's really uh, need to be uh, tested very carefully and have to be com uh, compared with every knowledge what we can have from astrophysics and astrophysical simulations. Um, the worldwide knowledge, the two most important nuclear reactions is the carbon fuel production, which is triple alpha reaction, and the oxygen 16 production, which is the uh, alpha capture on carbon fuel, which is the next step in that uh, production chain. Uh, the triple alpha reaction is known about 10 to 12 percent accuracy, the oxygen is about 15 to 20%. So both are not precisely ac uh, accurate, but uh, uh, could be improved and hopefully will be improved. Our measurement didn't improve the uncertainty, 
but give a very different number. So that's uh, something which has to be uh, explored. In nine, uh, 2013, Westhager and Austin published a paper when they uh, examined what, what are the implications of the uncertainties of the oxygen and carbon production rates for nuclear astrophysics. They used first stellar masses because obviously running a, a astrophysical calculation, all the physical condition has to be taken into account, uh, used 176 different models. And what they done, they independently varied the uh, triple alpha and oxygen reaction rates, practically exploring what will happen if uh, one of them will, will change. What they find from this one, that the relation between the two is very linear. So if the carbon production rate goes up, the alpha production rate goes up. If it goes down, then it has to go the other way. So we expect that uh, any measurement, any new measurement on the uh, carbon plus alpha capture rate would be very useful for settle the, the issue or every new nuclear physics experiment would be very useful to make further improvement. And finally, I just want to put up the long list of people, collaborators from the ANU, Oslo, Triumph, Osaka, Itemba, and a number of st students. Most of the work uh, carried out uh, Thomas Erickson and Badri Arshakhrani, two PhD uh, project uh, outcome of this uh, uh, program. So thanks very much. Okay, thanks very much, Thibaut. I didn't quite know how to do this, but... <laughs> Thought I'd find some applause for you. <laughs> mm. Okay. Very good. So, do you want to share the screen, Nick? Nico. Should I stop? Yeah, I can stop sharing the screen. Yeah. So, okay. uh, questions. Questions come in through chat. So, uh, so far, two people have sent in a couple of questions. Vitek Daktar uh, asks, is not the fusion cross-section alpha plus beryllium-8 also needed for getting the formation, the rate of formation of carbon-12? He asks. The fusion cross-section of uh, alpha plus beryllium-8, is that not needed for getting the rate of formation of carbon-12? I, mean, I, I believe that this is, this is, uh, this is the triple alpha rate. So uh, when, when beryllium-8 fuses with, with uh, carbon-12, that's uh, how it will be, will be created. But, oh, sorry, no, it's not needed. What, what is important is, is what fraction of the uh, carbon-12 will be re, uh, survive because the rest will be decay immediately. And, and uh, uh, I think all the uh, nucle nuclear astrophysics models are sensitive to the carbon to oxygen ratio. And that is driven by the, the carbon production rate and, uh, and the oxygen production rates. The production okay. rate, which is, yep. Okay, no, that's fine. The production rate uh, put forward by Rolf in 1988, it, it contains the radiative bit. Okay, he had another question. He said, would a summed uh, spectrum of hyperpure germanium plus, plus the anti-Compton BGO shield have helped improve the resolution of the high energy gamma rays? Well, yeah. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm it just was, reading these out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it was an interesting experience uh, measuring this very high energy gamma rays, which su uh, subject of Doppler shift and and uh, uh, it's broadening. So it's it's not not a trivial measurement. So I think Compton suppression not wouldn't be much help here. I uh, wanted to sum the two, but okay. Yeah. Now another one of your colleagues has asked a question, Andrew Stutzby. He says, Tibor, would you like to comment on the sources, origins of the differences between these new data and the old measurements? Well, 
you know, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I left out this one because of time constraint, but uh, uh, I think the main problem is randoms, how to deal with randoms. And, and uh, going through the, the five papers, which is uh, uh, reporting on the gamma rad over gamma within a two year time frame back in the 70s, each of them running at 10 to 50 kilohertz count rates, very, very high rates in order to get uh, enough numbers, enough counts. But I believe that they are subject of random events. And uh, one, one of the example, what we find in, in the only gamma ray measurement was actually that they made a mistake. The numbers are inconsistent. We can repeat their analysis without data. We can correct the analysis without data and we can pinpoint it exactly uh, where they made a mistake. And that, that was a factor two difference in their uh, analysis. Nobody picked up. Okay, uh, Thibault, there's uh, quite a few comments and questions coming on in the chat line, which I'll probably leave you to deal with privately. But in the meantime, I just want to congratulate you on a fantastic passion for the last 12, 13, 14, 15 years to go through a series of very, very compl complicated measurements to come up with these beautiful results. So very well done and uh, a brilliant talk. Thank you very much. And uh, a big round of applause to from virtual round of applause from how many participants have we got now? 100, almost 150 participants. So fantastic talk and a great start to the conference. Thank you very, very well done. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. Brilliant. <laughs> I can put on my YouTube applause. <laughs> <laughs> well done, brilliant. Okay, so, thank you. Uh, well, we're not quite on time, but that's not bad. It was a brilliant start. Uh, Morton, you're up next. <laughs>